Assignment Discovery now presents Last of the Czars, Revolution, Part 2. For the sake of Russia, I decided to take this step. All around me I see treason, cowardice, and deceit. Alexandra had no way of knowing that her husband had lost the throne. My own beloved, precious angel, light of my life. My heart breaks thinking of you all alone, going through all this anguish, anxiety, and we know nothing of you, nor you of us. To protect his invalid son, Alexei, Nicholas had insisted on abdicating in favor of his brother, Grand Duke Michael. The soldiers gathered and questioned them about how the Tsar had abdicated his throne. I abdicate in favor of Grand Duke Michael. Why not Alexei? No, he said, my son is ill. I'm not going to give him up. We will go to the Crimea and grow flowers. When they said the Tsar abdicated, we rejoiced. Uh, I remember my father coming in and saying, you can taste some champagne, because the Tsar abdicated. We drank champagne. But it wasn't that we were glad that the Tsar had abdicated. It was a question of another government, which was going to be better. I remember people came out onto the streets and were kissing each other, hugging each other. They were saying that autocracy is all finished, they will be democratically public now, freedom, equality. My grandfather, when he heard that the Tsar abdicated not only for himself, but also for his son, Alexis, he became pale like snow. And started having tears and even sobbed and said, well, now Russia is finished. Just like that. No one saw the once imperial family as a priority. Alexandra did not learn of her husband's abdication until the next day. In the palace, both water and electricity had been cut off. And not only had her adored Nikki been forced to abdicate, but also his brother Michael had rejected the throne. Now there was no czar at all. By the time Nicholas returned home, the Alexander Palace was in the hands of the Revolutionary Guards. No one was present when the ex-czar met his wife Alexandra. They themselves never wrote about it. It was said by the courtiers that Nicholas sank into his wife's arms and wept. Sometime afterward, Ludmila Krasina and her sisters walked past the palace, which was now patrolled by revolutionary guards. And one of these men, dressed in khaki, he looked like a soldier, was shoveling the snow away from the footpaths. I looked and I thought, this is not a soldier. This is the Tsar himself cleaning the paths of his garden. What is he doing, mademoiselle? I asked. He can't be the Tsar. Yes, she said. You see, he's been deposed. It's the revolution. He's a prisoner in his own palace, 
and he's not allowed to go out. He is guarded. And he is doing this to get some exercise. What amazed me, I was a little girl then, was that the Tsar was dressed in an old coat, which was all stained. It wasn't even clean. There were no decorations, nor epaulets. Many years have passed. I'm 90 now, but I still remember it. I still remember the Tsar's expression. There was such pain and suffering and tears in his eyes. The family's situation at the Winter Palace was house arrest rather than imprisonment, but it was still a far cry from their previous life. The leaders of the new provisional government were nervous about having the former Tsar so close to the capital. The simplest solution would have been to send the family abroad to one of their European relatives. But they could hardly go to their cousin, the Kaiser, with whom Russia was still at war. So the new government requested and received asylum in Great Britain for the Romanovs. <laughs> <laughs> 